thank you all for attending Dragons in Your Neighborhood. Just so everyone knows, this is not the actual live event. We had some technical glitches last Friday during the event. So as the host, I am recording the full introduction again, and Kevin is going to give his presentation all over again. <laughs> At the end, colleague and I will ask Kevin the questions that participants asked during the Q&A session. My name is Margot Rollins, and I am a program coordinator at Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. Today's expert is Kevin Monroe, coming to you from New York, where he works with the Nature Conservancy. He'll tell a little bit more about his background when he takes over. Our CEI public events are either usually done at one of our, our preserves, either the Osborne Preserve in Sonoma County on Sonoma Mountain in Pengrove, or near Yorkville in Mendocino County. And so we're all feeling the challenges of the shelter in place time that we're living in, all of us. We're happy to be able to reach people during this time and connect in new ways with everyone. So at this time, we usually pass around a sign-in sheet. But in lieu of that, can everyone please take just a moment to type their full name into the chat box? We have 48 people registered for this event, and we'd like to know who actually attended. And before I let Kevin take it away, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Center for Environmental Inquiry and how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you are affiliated with SSU or not, whether you're a student, faculty, staff, parent, educator, member of the public, or an organization in need of environmental solutions. The Center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions, and we invite you to get environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society by providing first-hand understanding of our connection with the environment and skill-building experiences that result in sustainable solutions. We're helping people become aware, prepared, and engaged in the natural world around them. There are many ways to get involved. You can engage in research, naturalist and land management training programs, internships, and student jobs. You can attend events like these access data from our websites, lead or contribute to events, partner with many projects, and on and on. You are an important element in addressing the greatest environmental challenges in history. An engaged society is critical, and diversity is critical. Today we're going to focus on almost mythical creatures, the mysterious dragonflies we see hovering and hunting all around us. They are an important element of the extensive biodiversity network and that is needed to maintain a healthy planet. Kevin will help us appreciate their talents and intricacies. This event is in the format of our local nature event, and it combines a live presentation with a local nature exploration. Kevin will explain exactly what that means in today's program. But first off, we're going to spend about 25 minutes hearing from Kevin and then 15 minutes exploring under his direction. Then we'll come back and ask questions until the program is over at 3, 3, 3 o'clock. Before we begin, I hope you've all had a chance to download the Dragonfly ID phone app and to visit odonatacentral.org. Also, grab any aquarium nets or kitchen strainers or sieves that could be used as nets to catch nymphs, particularly if they have handles. These will be useful if you choose to do one of the options that Kevin will present to us. Kevin also would like to ask to invite you to ask questions from time to time during the presentation. This he said to the attendees, we're not going to do that in this session. We're going to be doing it at the very end. So there's a lot of material to be covered, and so this will be an exciting adventure for all of us. Kevin, <laughs> take it away. Thank you, Margot. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. It's really exciting to uh, virtually be in California. <laughs> um, I'll just mention really quick my sort of New York, California connection. Um, I lived there in Sonoma County for four, four years, actually in Sebastopol very recently. I worked at both Laguna Foundation and um, SSU and CEI with Margo and Carrie and Claudia and the rest of the gang there. Um, really enjoyed both of those jobs and my time in California. Um, I'm now living in New York, working um, for the Nature Conservancy, and also really enjoy being here and enjoy that job, but do miss California, so I'm very happy to be uh, talking with all of you now. My background, really quick, is um, 
combination of environmental education and resource management. I've worked at, for various nonprofits and parks. Um, and I love dragonflies. So I'm looking forward to talking with you about them today. And before we start, I just want to mention, I know we're all dealing with all of the uh, stresses and challenges that COVID-19 has, has brought. And we've had to make adjustments and changes in our lives. And I just want to say it's OK if you're feeling stressed. And um, I want you to just enjoy this presentation. Don't worry about memorizing anything, obviously. Of course, it's all recorded, so you can go back and listen as many times as you'd like. And the main thing we want you to do is to get a new sort of um, joy about nature and to be interested in dragonflies, to want to get outside and interact with them and learn more about them. That's more important than memorizing anything specific. So just allow yourself to enjoy this presentation. And I'm now going to share my screen and jump into the, um, to the presentation here. Okay, so folks, I'm sorry, but it, it looks like Margot has frozen and I'm not able to um, share my screen. So, Carrie, I don't know if you're, if you're still. I think that that should be. You should be okay to do it now, Kevin. Okay. Awesome. I'm hoping. There we go. Cool. We're all set. Okay. Thank you, folks, for sticking with us with our technical difficulties here. Let me see. Okay. We're going to jump right in. So, yes, we're going to be talking about dragonflies today. Obviously, they are fascinating insects that I've been obsessed with for quite a while. So the first question that people ask are, what the heck is a dragonfly? It's a good place to start. So they are in the class Insecta. Other classes are mammals are a class, birds are a class. So that's about the size um, of a class. They are then in the order Odonata. Other orders of beetles are an order. Butterflies and moths, moths are in order. Now the order Odonata is split into two suborders. One of those is Anisoptera. Those are dragonflies and that's what we're gonna focus on today. The other suborder in Odonata is Zygoptera. Zygoptera are damselflies, so they're very closely related. We are gonna focus on dragonflies, which is Anisoptera today. So then people wanna know what the heck is the difference between the two? The best answer I had to that was a kid who raised her hand and said, well, damselflies are clearly the girls and dragonflies are the boys, which is a great answer, <laughs> but it's, it's not quite that simple. Um, dragonflies are larger, faster, more robust. They, they usually fly higher, where damselflies are sort of fluttering lower down. We're gonna jump right to a picture because a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So let's look at these two. Obviously the damselflies at the top. Look at the head. See how the head of the damselfly is a little bit like on a miniature level, the head of a hammerhead shark, right? You've got eyes on either side of the head with a big space in between. Look at the dragonfly head below. People often say, well, where are the eyes? The eyes are so big on the dragonfly head that it covers almost the whole head, so you don't even realize you're looking at the eyes. You can see there at that head, those eyes are huge and they touch. There's not a space between them like there is in the damselflies. Also look at the wings. The wings on the damselflies are folded above their back. Dragonflies cannot do that. Their wings stick out straight like wings on an airplane. So that's an easy way. And then just looking at their body, the damselflies are skinnier, more dainty. There's a book about damselflies called Flying Neon Toothpicks, which is a great way of describing them. Let's go to the next picture. So here's our first quiz of the day. You all tell me, which do you think this is, a damselfly or a dragonfly? Now I'm gonna bet that all of you looked at this, you probably saw the wings folded behind the back. You saw the space between the eyes, you saw the very thin abdomen, and you said, well, Kevin, of course, that's a damselfly, and you're right. 
Let's look at the next one. So what do you think this one is? I'm betting you all are looking at that and seeing those huge eyes that touch. You're seeing the wings stick out like wings on an airplane and you're seeing a much larger, more robust abdomen and you're saying, Kevin, well, of course that's a dragonfly and you are correct. So you're experts already. Okay, so then another good thing to know is, well, how many dragonflies are there? What kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, let's start at the bottom there. There's over 3,000 dragonflies in the world. There's over 300 in North America. And almost any place you go in the United States, there's going to be about 30 common species for you to learn in the large parks that you're in. Some places like Texas or Florida, it might be 40. Some places in the country where it's cooler in the north, it might be closer to 20. But if you learn about 30 common dragonflies, pretty much anywhere in the country, you're gonna be getting most of the common ones you'll see. So three is a good number to remember, as you can see these three sets of threes here. Okay, so what makes dragonflies special? Well, many, many things, and we're gonna talk about all of them today. One of the biggest are wings. Now they have four wings. Most insects have four wings. But that second bullet is what makes these guys and gals special in that all their wings can move independently. Each of their wings can be doing something different than the other wing. No other insect has that ability. And each wing can pivot separately. And we'll look at a picture of that in a minute. They can fly very fast. I used to think it was 35 miles an hour, but according to David Attenborough, it's 40 miles an hour. And whatever David Attenborough says, that's what I go with. So 40 miles per hour. Their wings can be 50 times per second. Just think about that for a moment. 50 times per second. That's a lot. <laughs> they can fly in all directions, including backwards and including upside down. And you'll learn why soon. And then their wing veins and their stigmas are important. What the heck are their stigmas? Well, let's just show you a picture. <clears throat> so you can see they have four independent wings here. You can kind of see the pivoting joints in that upper left picture of the dragonfly with the yellow and black stripes, the yellow and black stripes. You can sort of imagine those joints pivoting. Look at the dragonfly in the bottom part of the slide, the stigmas, those are Packets of dry blood is what make those stigmas, stigmas. And depending on the species, they may be different colors. Most dragonflies, it's just black, but some like this Halloween pennant are red. Others are white or yellow or blue. Those little dried packets of blood are supposed to provide counterbalance. It's supposed to help them fly, especially in a strong wind. These are those veins I was telling you about. They are rigid and hollow, which gives them both strength and light weight, kind of like a bird's wings. You know, they have hollow bones and then the, the um, shafts of a bird's feathers are also mostly hollow, so somewhat similar in that they're strong and lightweight, their wings. And some dragonflies, you can actually identify them by the patterns of their veins. What are some other flight adaptations? Well, they're, they have a serrated wing edge, which is really Im impressive. You can see in this picture here, that helps them cut through the air, reduces tur turbulence. Their hairs, which you see here, and their antenna can detect wind, speed, and direction. We've just learned recently their antenna do have some very basic chemical sensing abilities too. We used to think that they only detected wind and direct, wind speed and direction. We know now they have some really basic chemical detection too. We think they use that to help locate their prey. Okay, well, you can't talk about dragonflies without talking about their eyes. They have these two huge compound eyes that are made up of 28,000 units called omatidia. So that's 56,000 omatidia per dragonfly. In addition to that, they have three simple eyes called ocelli that we think help them with light and dark so they know, you know, the beginning and end of the day. 
They can see almost 360 degrees, very difficult to sneak up on them. They can see polarized and ultraviolet light, which we cannot. We believe that helps them find the horizon and also helps them find the surface of the water. And this one dragonfly in the right here is in a group of dragonflies called club tails that do have a slight space between their eyes. So this is a dragonfly that breaks the rules about having space between their eyes. Nature always likes to break rules. So you can see from this picture that that head is almost all eyeball. It's, it's a little unnerving. The size of their brain is maybe a peppercorn, if you're lucky. They're an extremely visual species. So like 90% of their head is eyeball and all the nerves connected to those eyeballs. Here's what you might, the last thing you might see if you were a mosquito before this clamp-tipped emerald dragonfly named because of his eyes took a bite out of you. You can almost see the little separate cells, the omatidia in their eyes, those little tiny squares. You can almost see them, 56,000 of those. Another thing that makes them special are their legs. Most insects have their legs spread out evenly along the length of their thorax. The thorax is that middle segment. But with dragonflies, those six legs, those six insect legs are towards the front of their thorax, near their head, so that they can form a sort of basket when they're hunting. Having all six legs closer together makes it easier for them to form a basket as they fly through the air and strain insects out of the air like whales using their baleen through the ocean. They use those spikes and those hairs on their legs to catch their prey. This is a black-shouldered spiny leg, a well-named dragonfly. You can see those impressive black spines on the hind legs. That's really the business part of the dragonfly. That's what they use to catch their prey, those spines. So here's a dragonfly showing you sort of all of his prey catching armor, those huge eyes for finding the prey, those legs covered with hooks, tarsal hooks and spines. He's hiding his jaws underneath his lip. Of course, it's very different from our lip, but they do have a sort of insect upper lip that hides his jaws. If you were able to see it, they would be sideways chewing jaws, not up and down like ours, but sideways like a cricket, grasshopper, cockroach, or a beetle. Sharp sideway jaws for eating their prey. How do you tell males and females apart? So that's called sexual dimorphism. How are the different sexes of the dragonfly different? Well, the males, as you can see from the top picture, have a very slender waist. Or maybe a better way of saying it is the female has a swollen, wider waist. That's because she's got to produce and store eggs, of course. So that's why she has a wide waist. You can also see their different colors. These two dragonflies in the lower part of the slide are widow skimmers. Same species, this could be brother and sister. But you can see their patterns are very different. The colors are different. So when you're learning dragonflies, you need to learn the male and female as well as the different species. Don't worry about all the details on this picture, on this slide. This is a little busier than it needs to be. I just wanted you to see that males and females have different appendages at the tip of their abdomen. The female has an ovipositor for laying eggs. Of course, males don't lay eggs, so they don't have that. In the lower picture, you can actually see the dragonfly eggs. Those little white balls are dragonfly eggs. The males have a Circe and an epiproct. Don't worry about what that is. Just look at those hooks, those hooked appendages on the tip of the male abdomen. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so they have this bizarre life cycle where the, male, the adults, males and females, fly around in the air, breathing oxygen from the air. They're out on the land. They mate. They lay eggs in the water or over the water or near the water, but usually in the water. Those little tiny white dots on that grass stem are the eggs. That's a grass stem like you'd see in your lawn. So you can imagine how tiny those eggs are. This grass stem is underwater. Those eggs hatch sometimes in a couple days, sometimes many months later. Out comes a gill breathing underwater nymph 
that looks nothing like the adult can live up to five years underwater, crawling around in the mud, taking oxygen out of the water with its gills. Then it climbs up on a stem, splits out of its old exoskeleton, and away flies the adult. So when the male and female are getting together and mating and laying eggs in the water, how are they setting up territory? Well, it's really all about the males. The males go down to the water where they think the females are gonna be attracted. They look for real estate that they think the female's going to want to lay her eggs in, and they fight over that real estate. They fight over that pond edge or river edge or stream edge, and they establish territories there. And then whatever females show up there, the males mate with them. And those territories are defended by the males doing what this blue dasher is doing, usually sticking their abdomen straight up. They have various displays and colors and posturing to defend those territories from other males. You can see all three of these males doing that, defending their territory. You can see the Circe and the Epiproct at the tip of the abdomen of one of these males. Remember, I showed you that before. We'll talk more about that later. It's all about location. The, the dominant male, the alpha male, that is the best at chasing away the others, will pick the tallest piece of grass in the meadow, the biggest rock in the middle of the stream, the best branch on the edge of a river for him to see other males to chase away and see females to mate with. So it's all about location. The females and the immature males tend to spend their time away from the water because they don't want to deal with those highly territorial, aggressive males. They spend their time in meadows or forests or other feeding areas away from the aggressive, mature males. They don't go down to the water until they're ready to mate. So a good place to find the females and immature males is often in a meadow or a forest near the water. So they have this somewhat bizarre mating position that's often called the wheel position. The reason it's so strange is as you can see from both of these pictures, they have to sort of match up these parts that don't really fit. The male's reproductive appendage is at the base of his thorax. The female's reproductive appendage is at the tip of her abdomen. So she has to take the underside of the tip of her abdomen and match it up with the bottom of his thorax makes it a little tricky. To make this all work, the male uses the Circe and the Epiproct that we've, I've shown you a couple times, those hooks in the end of his abdomen, to latch onto the back of her eyeballs. He is holding the back of her head with those hooks on the tip of his abdomen. They can stay in this position sometimes just for seconds, depending on the species of those 3,000 species. There are some species that stay in this position for over an hour. And in that position, they can fly faster than I can run. I've tried chasing them while they're in the wheel position. It's amazing to me that they can still coordinate their flight. She is upside down and backwards, and they're still flying in perfect coordination, a little bit like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Damselflies are also mating in the wheel position. Just so you know, when you see insects doing this, it might still be a damselfly. They also do the same thing. So the male mates with the female, the two of them mate, and then the male is guarding her. It's called mate guarding. What he's really doing is, is um, guarding his, his genetic material. He doesn't want an other male to mate with her. An other male could come remove the sperm that he inserted and then insert his own. So what the male does is he often guards the female. He holds on to her until she's done mating, I'm sorry, done laying eggs, so that he can chase away any other competing males. Not all species do this. Some dragonflies mate, it takes two seconds, they fly away and that's the end of it. Um, for other species, the, the male does do the mate guarding, which is called tandem. The female in this picture is slicing open the underwater part of this water lily stem and injecting eggs with her blade-like ovipositor. She's actually injecting eggs into that stem underwater while the male is holding on to her. And this is just a close-up that you can see he's got his Circe and his ep epiproct latched on really to the back of her eyeballs there. 
So a little more about the larva. I've mentioned most of this already. Again, they do breathe through their gills. As you can see, they look very different from the adults. They can live a few weeks to up to eight years. The species here in America, the longest they can live is eight years, but there are some Asian species where the nymph can live up to eight years. So five years here, eight years in some places in Asia. Many of the species here are only larva for two weeks. So it's anywhere from two weeks to five years here in the US, depending on the species. They're incredible predators. They mostly eat little things like mosquitoes, but they can also eat fish, salamanders, and tadpoles. The larva crawls out of the water, usually at night. I, I put here often near dawn, but it's really at dark because they don't want the birds to eat them as they crawl out of the water. So they mostly do it at, at dark during the night. They'll climb up a stem, they'll split out of the exoskeleton and the adult will fly away. They usually fly away right at dawn, but the actual emergence starts at night. When they first come out, they're very vulnerable. Even a possum walking around a pond or a lizard could catch them. They can't fly yet. Their tenorals, that's what they're called when they first come out, tenorals. They're very delicate and unable to fly. They need at least 15 or 20 minutes in the sun for their wings to fill with blood. They pump blood from their body into those hollow veins we looked at. That allows their wings to harden so they can fly away. This dragonfly in the lower right of your screen, unfortunately its wings did not dry right. It'll never be able to fly, so that will become food for some bird, I imagine. What do dragonflies eat? If it's smaller than them and it's moving and they can catch it, they're gonna eat it. So I, I made this long list of things, but it really doesn't matter. If it's a smaller than them and it's moving, they're gonna eat it, especially insects. They specialize in insects, but they will eat spiders. They'll pluck spiders right out of their web sometimes. And they do eat each other. Dragonflies are true cannibals and they eat other damselflies. Here is a pair of mating damselflies that are getting eaten by a dragonfly. This is where, as I say, romance has gone horribly wrong. The damselflies are attached with the Circe and Epiproc on the back of her head. So she can't get away. So their honeymoon has gone quite wrong as this dragonfly is gonna end up eating them both. So what eats them? Well, pretty much everything that's bigger than them that can catch them. Praying mantids, robber flies, spiders, predatory wasps, everything. You can see this list here, but it's basically everything bigger than them that can catch them that is a predator is going to eat them including other dragonflies. Some dragonflies specialize in only eating other dragonflies. This is a cobra club tail that likes eating other club tails and he is so focused that even when I picked him up, he continued munching on this Eastern ringtail dragonfly while he was sitting on my thumb. This is a dragon hunter. It's actually the name of this dragonfly. It's the most powerful dragonfly in North America. That are, there are some that are a tiny bit bigger, but this is the strongest. He is perched on a stem overhanging a creek with his arms open, <laughs> a sort of alarming possible embrace. He's waiting for any dragonfly flying down his stream and he's gonna go out and eat him. So what else can be bothersome to a dragonfly? Well, parasites. There are tiny wasps called fairy wasps the smallest insects in the world, they will dive underwater and chase after the dragonfly eggs as they fall through the water. They will lay their eggs in the dragonfly egg and then the adult swims back up to the surface and flies away. They could be underwater trying to find that egg for a full day, breathing from the air in the bubble around them. Then the baby wasp feeds off of that dragonfly egg. And then when it's finished, it pops out of that egg and swims up to the top and flies away. Fascinating little wasps. There are also mites. This one dragonfly has thousands of little blood sucking mites living in its abdomen. Takes a lot of energy to be a dragonfly. They are cold blooded. So temperature regulation is important. They bask in the sun like lizards and snakes. If they get too hot, they stick their abdomen straight up in the air. This is called obelisking. 
It reduces the surface area of their abdomen, allows them to cool off when they get too hot. And then again, if they get too cold, here's a dragonfly wing whirring. Just like us shivering to, to warm up, they will shiver their wings to warm up their muscles. Couple other just sort of random interesting tidbits. There are some dragonflies, very few, but there are, I think, um, four species out of those 300 here in the United States that practice camouflage well on a daily basis like this gray paddle tail. There are other dragonflies like the tiny one in the upper right corner of your screen called an amber wing that imitate a hornet or a wasp. If you go up to it, they start shaking their wings and their abdomen just like a hornet. And in this lower species, the club tail, scientists believe that it's trying to possibly imitate a scorpion or even maybe a tree snake with that widened abdomen. We're not going to do questions now, as Margot explained, this is not the actual live recording, so we'll read over the questions at the end. So where do you find dragonflies? Well, it's a good opportunity to talk about watersheds. A watershed is an area that sheds all of its water to one place. It gathers water and sends it to one place, like a funnel. This is the Laguna watershed here, so every drop of rain that falls on this map is going to flow down to the Laguna and it's split into six sub watersheds. These are six sub watersheds within the Laguna watershed. Every place on the planet is part of a watershed. Even a desert gets rains occasionally and that flows somewhere. So anywhere in the world that you are standing, you are part of a watershed where water is going to flow to some low central point. And dragonflies are a great way to talk about watersheds. I often describe them as the flashy fruit of a healthy watershed. If you take water quality, habitat diversity, and food web health, and you put all of that into a watershed, what comes out on the other side is dragonfly diversity. So they're great environmental indicators. You can look at those colorful adults flying around and they will tell you in part how healthy the watershed is. And that makes them really excellent watershed ambassadors. You can use them to talk about any aspect of watershed conservation that you want to, including some ones that I've listed here. And it's a great biota or group of animals for citizen science because they live in so many different habitats. So most watersheds you go to are gonna have dragonflies. They're not easy to ID, but they all are possible. So your average citizen, like all of us, can learn to identify them. And they are indicators of diversity and ecosystem condition, as I've mentioned. So they're excellent creatures to use for citizen science, which is why scientists around the world use them for that purpose. Okay, so where are you gonna find them? Well, when water, sunlight, and structure comes together, you're going to have dragonflies. I should say freshwater. There's only one species of dragonfly in North America that lays eggs that breeds in salt water. So I should have the word fresh there. Fresh water plus sunlight plus structure, you're gonna have dragonflies. Whether it's a marsh, pond, pool, stream, they all have sun, they all have water, they have some sort of structure for them to perch and hide in. So what's the difference between a, a habitat generalist and a specialist? Well, some dragonflies are generalists. You can find them in any of these four habitats. Other dragonflies are habitat specialists, like this arrowhead spike tail. She's only going to be in a stream that is a certain depth, a certain width, a substrate of just the right silt and pebble mixture, and just the right amount of sun and flow so this is a, a very specialized dragonfly. These are two more, the tiger spike tail and the spine crowned club tail are very picky about either having clean, fast, rocky rapids or tiny forest seepages. They are habitat specialists. Okay, so where are you gonna look? When you're out looking for dragonflies, as I hope all of you are itching to jump out and go look for dragonflies, where are you gonna look? Well, take a look at this picture and think about sunlight, structure, and water. So where would you look here for dragonflies? I would suggest looking where those three things all come together. So look at the edge of that stream. 
Look at the tall grass and the fence posts near the edge of the stream where the dragonflies are gonna perch. Look at the shrub and tree branches overhanging the water. Branches that are in the sunlight near the water. So it's all about sunny edges. I would really emphasize that that when you're at any of these wetland habitats you're looking at here, you're going to look for the sunny edge, where again, there's water, sun, and structure. The one exception, as I mentioned in the lower right-hand picture, dragonflies will hunt far from water. You can actually see dragonflies over soccer fields, baseball fields, even parking lots, hunting for gnats. You could see them over a meadow, like this lower right-hand picture. They're gonna be breeding and mating and courting near water, but you can see them hunting far from water where they're flying insects. Okay, don't worry about all the details on this slide. I do have a list here of really good local spots in Sonoma County that you can look for dragonflies. Also Galbreath Preserve, which of course is in Mendocino. Um, so you can look at this at your leisure at a later point. If you live somewhere outside of Sonoma County or outside of California, you can just follow those habitat pointers that we talked about before. I wanna focus on the things in orange on this page. Dragonflies in warm climates, like the tropics or the south, southern parts of the US and even Northern California can be seen year round. But in many parts of the country, they don't really show up um, until May or June, like where I live here in New York. And even in Northern California, where they can be seen all year, it's really June before they, come com before they become common. So there are two species you can actually see in December and January in Sevastopol, but they're very hard to see. It's really June through September that dragonflies are easiest to see and most abundant. And again, that number 30, there are about 30 common species, most places in the country where you are. Um, so you can do that. Just think 30 is not an overwhelming number. You can do that. Okay, some tips on IDing dragonflies in the field. I'm not going to go into specific species. There are some great field guides I'm gonna refer you to. I'm gonna talk more about tools and methods. So let's talk about first glance field marks. When you see a dragonfly and you're trying to figure out what it is, don't worry too much about the specific color and markings. People sometimes over focus on that. Really look at the behavior. What is it doing? Look at these pictures here. Is it doing lots of perches? Is it constantly flying? Is it doing short periodic flights? There are seven families of dragonflies in North America and each family has different flight habits. So pay attention to what the dragonfly is doing, not just what it looks like. Then when you do get to the appearance, size can help a little bit, but don't get too specific. It's hard to judge in the field. Is it tiny? Is it really large? Or is it somewhere in the middle? The color and markings. Do they have markings on the wings, like the dragonfly at the top of the middle of your screen? Or are the wings completely clear with no markings? That's a easy way to do process of elimination. Most dragonflies do not have markings on their wings. And then context is important. Location, where are you? Different dragonflies live in different states, different counties. So that can help, help you figure out what you're looking at. What's the date and season? Those 300 dragonflies in North America come out at different times. Some are out for two weeks in April and that's it. So if you're looking for dragonflies in August, you know you don't have to look for the April, April dragonflies. Habitat, look around. That's a picture of a stream, but the stream dragonfly that lives there, I found in the meadow right next to it, very well camouflaged, you can barely see it in that second picture. That's a stream dragonfly, it's a female, so she's staying away from the males, she's perched in the meadow next to the stream. So not only look at the habitat that you're standing at, but what habitats are you adjacent to? What's around you? Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about context clues really helping. These three medium-sized red skimmers look quite similar, right? So you might see these and think, oh my God, I'm gonna to have to pour over a field guide for an hour and look at the difference between the second segment or of the abdomen or 
how many veins in the wings are red or are they orange? It's actually much easier than that because of context clues. So now these three skimmers become really easy. The neon skimmer is only in central and southern California. So if you're anywhere on the coast of Northern California, you don't have to worry about what makes the neon different from the flame. It doesn't matter because the, the neon is not going to be in Northern or coastal California. Red rock skimmer only lives in clean, rocky streams. So if you're at a cattail surrounded pond in Santa Rosa and you see a red skimmer, it's not gonna be a red rock skimmer, not gonna be a neon skimmer. Context clues, you know it's a flame skimmer. This lower picture, that's me <laughs> pontificating to everybody at a field trip in California, telling them all about how I'm looking at a California darner. Well, in fact, I was wrong. Someone looked at the picture weeks later and pointed out to me it was a blue-eyed darner. I am used to blue-eyed darners in Virginia, where I'm from, being rare. So I was not focusing on where I was. <laughs> I hadn't even had blue-eyed darner in my mind because I think of them as being rare. Well, I needed to remember where I was. I was in California. They're not rare there. And I was so focused on assuming that it was a California darner that I forgot to actually see. If I had actually looked closely at the dragonfly in front of me, I would have seen it had a brilliant blue head, hence blue-eyed darner. California darners don't have brilliant blue heads. So remember where you are and don't forget to actually see. Okay, so how are you going to identify these dragonflies? We've talked about some tools and methods. What are some other tools to help you? Field guides. I always recommend having at least two field guides with you in the field. Kathy Biggs is one of the foremost dragonfly experts in not only the California, but the entire Pacific um, coast and even the Southwest. Um, and she lives right there in Sebastopol. She, my understanding is she has retired now, but some of her books are still in print. You can go to that website that I have listed there and find which of her books are still in print. I suggest getting as many as you can. In addition, her website has step-by-step -step instructions on how to create and maintain a backyard pond. So go to that website, check out her books, and learn from her how to make your own dragonfly pond. This is one of my favorite field guides. It's actually the most current field guide. Um, one of its attributes is it's a life-size field guide. What the author means by that is for each species, he has one picture that's the actual life size, which is helpful. And it has many other wonderful aspects, including a seasonal graph, great pictures, good stories. That's a wonderful book. And then there's this great app that you can use on either your iPhone or your Android. It's a Dragonfly ID app made by Odonata Central. Um, it's wonderful for various reasons, three special things about it. You can, it has a key. So you can tell this app what color your dragonfly is, what size it is, and what habitat you're in, and where you live. You can put in your county, state, or zip code, and it will use that information to tell you what dragonfly it probably is. So that's wonderful that you have this infield key. It also has a really neat um, seasonal graph for each species. So it can tell you what week that dragonfly is actually flying around. And you can click on the little globe on the app, the little picture of the globe, and again, you can put in your zip code, state, county, or you can just put nearby. The iPhone will figure out where you are and then tell you what dragonfly species are near you. So that's very helpful. Really good citizen science. You can send in your photos and observations and contribute to dragonfly science and research around the country with this app. Another good dragonfly citizen science project um, the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership and Pond Watch. There are six species of dragonflies that are found in almost all 50 states. If you see them, one of those six species, you can enter that information at this website and it will help us learn more about dragonfly migration. We know almost nothing about dragonfly migration except that some of these six species have been known to cross oceans 
They've shown up in Ireland from North America. They have flown across the country. They often migrate on the same routes as birds. We know very little about it. This helps us learn more. Okay, so dragonflies are obviously awesome and we want to attract and conserve them, right? So how do we do that? Well, their biggest issues are habitat destruction and water quality degradation. So if we fix those two things, that goes a long way. It's all about watershed health. Keep your watershed healthy, you have healthy dragonflies. What can you do? You can reduce fertilizer and pesticide use. You can protect local natural areas and parks so they stay natural and protected. And you can and also encourage other people not to mow or clear down to the edge of the water. People often mow or clear down to the edge of a stream or a river or a pond. What that does is remove the adult dragonflies and increase mosquitoes. You want that vegetation on the edge of the pond or the stream. That's good hunting perching area for adults that will eat mosquitoes. So you really don't want to clear down to the water. And you can create your own backyard water feature. Kathy Biggs website that I just showed you is a great way to do that. Um, there's a little thing called a BT mosquito dunk that looks like a little dried bagel. You can buy those over the internet. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. It's not a pesticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria that only attacks fly larva. So you can put those in a bird bath. If you feed birds, you can put that in your dragonfly pond. It will kill the mosquito larva, but not hurt salamanders or dragonflies or birds or fish. So you can also go to my website to learn about dragonfly and wildlife pools. My website address is down there at the bottom. Um, Kathy Biggs' website, honestly, is, is much more helpful because she gives you more details. My, mine just kind of talks about general habitat requirements. Dragonflies do like shallow ponds with gradual slopes because that's more surface area for them and their nymphs. They like vegetation for their nymphs to hide and for them to hunt from. And it has to be sunny. They're like flying solar panels. So it needs to be marshy, shallow, gradual slope, lots of vegetation, must be sunny. sunny. Again, you can go to my website and learn more. A third resource for making a backyard pond, this might be one of the best right here. Again, the website is down at the bottom. This gives you actual pond maintenance as well as step-by-step -step on how to create a pond. This website and Kathy's are really the best for step-by-step -step on how to make a pond and maintain it. Okay, folks, so you've listened to me pontificate for a while. We have gone through some fun dragonfly slides. Now this is an opportunity for you to have some fun dragonfly activities. As we've mentioned before, this is not the live recording, um, but you can go back and look at this and do any of these four personal activities anytime that you want. And these are all fun to invite other people to help you with. I'll just go over them real briefly. They're pretty self-explanatory. You can explore that Dragonfly ID app that I mentioned. And again, the website is right there. If it's early in the year or if it's a cloudy day or if it's winter, it may not be a time that you can actually identify a Dragonfly, but you can still have fun exploring that Dragonfly ID app, learning more about it so you're ready when the Dragonflies are flying around. Um, and I have a little tip there. You can use the little funnel shaped icon in the upper right corner, once you're on that app, you click on that and that will take you to the guide where you can put in the color, the size, the habitat, and it tells you what dragonflies are there. Draw your own dragonfly. Learn what you've learned today about dragonfly anatomy, adaptations and behavior. Create your own species. You can be super scientific, creative, whatever you want to do, have fun with it. Create your own dragonfly. Number three, catch and photograph a nymph. If you live close to a pond, a marsh, even a little flooded roadside ditch with vegetation, you can take an aquarium net or one of those little kitchen sieves or strainers with a handle or any water net that you might have. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna use that to sort of brush and sweep the underwater vegetation. The dragonfly nymphs are not in the water, so to speak, they're underwater clinging to the vegetation. So take whatever your little device is 
and brush it kind of firmly against the aquatic vegetations underwater. You're trying to knock the nymphs off and into your sieve. So imagine trying to knock them off the vegetation. Then you can take a picture, take a picture from several different angles. It's okay to hold them gently and then put it back in the water, of course, and then you've got that picture to learn more about it. Number four, this is my favorite, visualize and plan your personal dragonfly observation trail. Think about all you've learned about dragonflies today, about the kind of habitat they like. Then imagine in, in your mind, imagine the parks, streams, ponds, lakes, marshes, swamps, ditches, trails, meadows, in your neighborhood, in your county, or even in your state. This can be a trail that takes you three hours to traverse if you want, or it can be a 15 minute trail in your neighborhood. Come up with a trail, make a little list or a little map, and then have fun going on that dragonfly trail once a week, once a month, once a season, whatever works for you. It's a fun thing for you to do later this season in the late spring, summer, and early fall. Bring some friends with you make it a really neat outing, show them your dragonfly observation trail, and you can do really fun citizen science and nature photography all through that whole process. And you can contribute to our knowledge about dragonfly migration. Okay, so I think what we're going to do now is ask and answer the questions that you all have submitted us, submitted to us when we did have the, the live class. So I think Carrie and Margo are going to ask some questions for us. Yeah, so I'm here. Can you hear me, Kevin? I sure can. Um, do you think we should leave that up on the screen? Um, I think they can see my face now. So Margo, are you there as well? Maybe she's still muted. No, I'm oh, there you are. Yeah, so it's up to you what we can leave this up or should we take it down so everybody can see our smiling faces? Um, I think, Margo, whatever we see on your screen is what's recorded. So can you see our faces and the PowerPoint? Because that would be ideal. I can. Great. Leave, let's leave it the way it is then. Awesome. Okay, All so right. what, what questions do we have? So the, the first set of questions or comments were submitted after the 15-minute breakout when Kevin asked people to share what they had experienced when they were out in the field. And so the first one, Carrie and I are going to toggle back and forth with these questions. The first one was, I've been exploring the app. I live near Rabel Park in Sebastopol, and I've seen a blue tiny damsel and a dragonfly in my garden. That's wonderful. And I'll just say that uh, Rabel Ranch Park, I have spent many an hour hiking through that park. It's a wonderful park that's good for dragonflies. You have streams and marshes and swamps and meadows. Um, there's probably vivid dancers and blue dashers there. Those are some little blue damselflies and dragonflies. So that's a great place to look for them. The next comment uh, person said, I drew a picture, um, but next week I'll be staying up at our pond on the ranch in Healdsburg. So we'll start seeing dragonflies after we punch holes in the duckweed. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. Well, Healdsburg is a wonderful place to look for dragonflies. There's some great nature preserves. In that area, I know land paths own some there, as do others. So Healdsburg's a great place to look for dragonflies. And yes, if you do have duckweed completely covering the surface of your pond, duckweed isn't necessarily bad, but if there's too much of it, if it's covering the whole, whole surface, there will be less dragonflies because they do need some open water to lay eggs. And also you want some open water so sunlight can get down to submerged aquatic plants. So if you have duckweed completely covering your pond, just try to break it up from time to time and net some of them. There's some open water. So uh, one of the other attendees said that they also had explored the app and they really liked the idea and the fact that you could select a specific region when you're using the app. I think that's honestly one of the most important parts about that app you can, I don't know if, if I would call it wasting time, but you can certainly spend a lot of time <laughs> flipping, flipping through a field guide, looking at dragonflies that actually are not anywhere near where you are. And it might take you a while to realize the dragonfly you're looking at is actually 300 miles away from where you are. So this app tells you right away, 
you know, you, mm -hmm. you put in your location and it will only show you dragonflies in range for where you are. So it saves a lot of time it's, and it's very educational. Well, the next comment was my comment on Friday. Um, and it said, I made a map. And so my map's gotten a little shabbier, but I still have it. So, Wonderful. oh, you it. can't really see it because of the backlighting. Okay. Uh -oh. And I'll well, make you can really okay. oh, you, you a little bit. A little anyway, bit. I just drew my house okay. and then about it. Yeah. I have a creek that goes near my house, but right where I live, it's in concrete. <laughs> um, but it opens up on both sides. So if I walk one direction or the other direction, then there's a lot of opportunities. Um, but uh, the map I made is a bicycle trail because I don't really think I could walk this whole thing, but I could bike it. And it includes a marsh, a little area with a waterfall, um, Phoenix Lake, I live in Marin. Um, and then over by the Larkspur Ferry, um, there's a, a path over there. You can get to the water where there's some foliage. So. I have four places to go that I could even do during the shelter in place. That's wonderful, Carrie. And that's, it's so perfect to have it be on a bike because then you're not harming the environment <laughs> in a way, just riding your bike along, which is great. And there's so many good dragonfly spots right along trails, right? Most trails are going to go by a stream or a mm -hmm. pond or a ditch or a lake at some point. So you don't have to be doing really difficult bushwhacking through some wild area. You can just be walking, jogging, walking your dog, riding your bike, and you'll see all sorts of great dragonfly spots. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, someone else said, I also explored the app, and I love how I'm having all of these great resources. I teach earth science to sixth graders, and I can see so many possible things to do with my students. That's really encouraging to hear. Yeah, I think of dragonflies as being one of the best teaching tools out there. First of all, how can you not love dragonflies? You know, even kids that might not be super excited about school, you can get them excited about a dragonfly. Um, I mean, just that name, you know, it's got dragon in the name, they're colorful, they're sort of ferocious, they're interesting, they're bizarre, so attention. And you can use them to teach predator-prey relationship, mm -hmm. water quality, food webs, metamorphosis, citizen science, um, courtship and, and mating and breeding behavior. I mean, there's so many things you can use dragonfly. Water flight. quality and yes. bigger picture. You know, they were the size of what, how big did you say in our, when we were talking earlier about how big they were in the time of the dinosaurs? Yes, yes, thank you, Carrie. Yeah, they were, they had wingspans that were two and a half feet wide during the time of dinosaurs. <laughs> that's, that's huge. So you can use them to talk about evolution, talk about dinosaurs in the Jurassic period. Big picture, like Carrie said, you can use them to talk about climate change. Dragonflies are very dependent on very specific aspects of weather and climate. So we're already noticing that dragonflies are coming out and disappearing and migrating at different times, in large part because of climate change. Um, so you can use, there are also dragonflies that are endangered species right here in North America. I think there's one in Wisconsin that's an endangered species, the type of emerald. You can use them to talk about conservation. It's hard to get insects on on threatened and endangered lists. So if they are on it, it means there's probably plenty more that could be. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, there's very few drag, especially land insects on um, endangered species list. I, I think it's called a Heinz emerald. I know it's in Wisconsin and it's an emerald. Beautiful little dragonfly with brilliant green eyes that's, that's quite rare. Um, and I, as Carrie said, I, I'm sure there are other dragonflies that probably should be on that list. I have family there. I will let them know to look out for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the next question, or actually comment, um, I remember the one, this one. It was from our outreach assistant, Nicolette. Uh, she drew a dragonfly. Um, and I can't remember if this is her comment or someone else's. Uh, I was wondering if the Cersei on male dragonflies are always visible or only present during mating. Right, right. Well, first, I'll just ad address the drawing. I remember it, Nicolette did a, a beautiful job. It was a big dragonfly, sort of darner-like. And I asked her, 
if she had imagined where that dragonfly might live. And she said it was going to live on Spring Lake in Sonoma County. <laughs> she made it big so it could be the alpha dragonfly and be in, in charge of all the other dragonflies. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, Carrie, what was the question? Oh, the, about Cersei on the male dragonflies. Are they always there? Yes, the, the Cersei and the Epiproct are always there. They don't, they're not hidden. They don't come out during breeding. They're always there in exactly the same way. And I'm pretty sure, just for the record, that Nicolette's picture, uh, I took a screenshot of it. It might actually be on our Facebook page, the Center Facebook page. As People want to see be. it. As it should be. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Any other questions? There are, I think. So the question, question, you've kind of already addressed it, but the question was, how does duckweed on a pond affect mm -hmm. dragonfly habitat? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll just mention again that in general, good dragonfly habitat has a combination of open water and what I would call vegetated water. So you don't want a pond that's completely covered, but it's also best to have a pond that does have some plants on the surface, or at least lots of plants around the edge. The plants are imp important, but you do want enough open water so the females can tap their abdomen on the surface and lay their eggs. You saw that dragonfly that was inserting her eggs with her ovipositor in the stem of an underwater plant. There are also dragonflies that simply hover over the water and tap the surface of the water with their abdomen and eggs fall out when <coughs> they do that. And they need open water to do that. And you can all look for that this summer. Look for a female dragonfly hovering over the surface of the water, tapping the water with the tip of her abdomen. Well, speaking of uh, habitats and water, um, someone's asking about vernal pools and if they're too ephemeral to be a dragonfly habitat. I love that question. That may be my favorite. Yeah, vernal pools, of course, are temporary bodies of water that are really good for certain amphibians, certain salamanders and frogs that don't compete well with fish. So they lay their eggs in water that dries up after a couple of months and therefore doesn't have fish. Well, there are dragonflies that are the same way, that will only lay their eggs in fishless water. Yeah. So vernal pools are perfect for some very specific species of dragonflies that will only lay their eggs in vernal pools. And then there are other dragonflies that won't come near vernal pools, it depends on the species. But in California, there are several vernal, vernal pool dragonflies. Can we find dragonflies alongside a moving stream? Right. Yeah, I remember a couple people had that question. Yes, um, there are some dragonflies that only lay their eggs in moving, highly oxygenated streams and rivers because that's what the nymphs need. The adults only need flying insects to eat, right? So their nymphs are what's picky. So the dragonfly adults are looking for a habitat that's gonna be right for their aquatic nymphs. And some dragonfly nymphs need highly oxygenated, cold, fast flowing water. Um, you can find more dragonflies more easily in still water. You go to a pond or a marsh or a lake, they're more abundant. There are dragonflies at flowing water, streams and rivers, but they're harder to find and they're more spread out. So they're there, you just have to really be a detective to find them. I know we have them in the a part of Copeland Creek that flows through the Osborne Preserve and it's where it's rocky. And so there's a lot of like mini waterfalls. So it is pretty oxygenated, but it's, it's also really shallow most of the time. So it's rather calm at the same time. Osborne, exactly what Carrie is describing, the only place I've ever seen a red rock skimmer, which is one of the most beautiful dragonflies in all of California, hands down, was at Osborne Preserve. Mm -hmm. and I actually saw a male and a female, so it wasn't just a passing dragonfly. There's a breeding population there. Um, and red rock skimmers only live in clean, healthy streams. So shows that Osborne has some special habitat. And I have no doubt that Galbraith Preserve not only has red rock skimmers, but 
probably spike tails and club tails mm. and walker darners. There are some beautiful streams of Galbreath. I'm sure there are some very special dragonflies there too. We've seen nymphs in those ponds at Galbreath. Wonderful. Um, I'm sure Margo's seen a lot more than me. Um, <laughs> so I, the I, next, I know that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to go to the next question. Um, it starts with a uh, statement. So this person saw their first vivid dancer the day before yesterday in Santa Rosa. So that would have been last Wednesday, April 22nd. Um, and they said that it seems a bit early. Is that what you would say too? Yeah, yeah, I'd say it, it is a bit early. It's not unheard of. And when you see adult dragonflies can have a lot to do with um, how warm or cold it is that particular season. It's not gonna change by a month, but vivid dancers might come out a week earlier if the water temperature gets warm enough so the nymphs feel it's time to come out. Um, so that's a little early, but not unheard of. Vivid dancers are well-named. They're brilliant, almost neon, vivid blue, beautiful little damselflies. I have a follow-up question. Um, what about seasonal changes where we have these like false starts to summer or spring, like in California? Does that mess with their cycles or life, si life stages? It, it can, but in general, species evolve pretty well to whatever particular climate they're in. So in parts of the country where you have a lot of fluctuation in seasonal temperatures like that, what I believe happens is the emergence of dragonflies there is more spread out. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have nymphs coming out at slightly different times anyways. So if a bunch of them come out and then there's a cold snap and they die, there'll be another batch that comes out the next week. Mm -hmm. Plus in general, dragonflies lay quite a few eggs. <laughs> so, um, even if quite a few of them die because of a cold snap, there's still gonna be enough that make it that sort of carry through. That's, in, that's encouraging. Yes. <laughs> uh, again, this is kind of a repeat, but it might, it's worded differently, it might spark a different response from you, Kevin, but this person says, I looked around on Google Maps for streams and ponds in my area. Do dragonflies have preferences for ponds versus rivers? And does fast moving water affect them? Sure. I mean, it, it, it's a good question to ask twice. Um, <laughs> so much of being able to find different species of dragonflies is going to a diversity of habitat. The habitat that's easiest to find dragonflies, as I mentioned before, is ponds and lakes. But there are some really interesting, colorful, kind of bizarre dragonfly species that live in those streams and rivers. What I often suggest to people is start at a neighborhood pond. It's easier. You can stand in one place, see six different species, sort of you know, become a dragonfly geek, get your footing. And then your next step is to go looking in a forest stream or a river. That's gonna be harder. You might look for two hours and find one species but that one species is gonna be a rare dragonfly that makes your heart beat. So start with the ponds because they're easier, but then yes, the streams and rivers have other species that are just gonna take a lot more work. It's gonna be harder, but it'll be rewarding to find them. The fastest dragonflies in the world, the one that, that David Attenborough described as 40 miles per hour, lives in the rivers of North America. Fastest dragonfly in the world, um, it's called a swift river cruiser. And there is a Western version of that that lives in Sonoma County in California. So if you go out to a river and find that, you're looking at the fastest dragonfly on the planet. So it's worth the extra. And um, uh, did you mention if dragonflies are faster than most other insects? Do you know that? Yes. The, my understanding, this is going to be a little gross, but <laughs> my understanding is the fastest insect in the world is something called a bot fly, B-O-T, bot fly. The second fastest are dragonflies. Okay. Why are bot flies so fast? Well, bot flies lay their eggs. There's different kinds of bot flies. There's a type of bot fly in Africa 
that lays its eggs in the nostrils of an antelope. So it has to be able to fly 60 miles an hour to catch up with the antelope who does not want having eggs laid in its nostrils. <laughs> so that's the fastest insect in the world, but the second fastest after that are the dragonflies. So the next participant question is pretty general. Can you tell us anything more about using the app or the website? Sure. So Odonata Central has changed a lot. I used to spend a lot of time on Odonata Central and it was quite a different site. Odonata Central now is basically a platform for the app. So if you're used to going to Odonata Central and seeing thousands of photographs sort of on a field guide level, that's all moved to the app now. So the website is basically set up for the app. The app is fantastic in lots of ways. I will say it's relatively new. I think the app is only two years old. They're still working out a couple of kinks. It works better on iPhones than Android. So if you read about reviews of it, people with Androids aren't quite as happy with it as people with iPhones. Um, but th they're working that out. That's getting better. That may have been fixed already. Um, what makes the app special, as I said before, is you can just click nearby. Your iPhone knows where you are. It tells the app and then instantly you are only shown options of species that are nearby. So it makes it easier. It's really cool that you can go to the key on the, on the app and you can put in the color of your dragonfly, the habitat and the size, and it will tell you what dragonfly it thinks you're looking at. You can say, I'm looking at a red and black dragonfly that's a medium size and I'm standing next to a river. And it will send you two pictures and say, well, given your location and that description, it has to be one of these two dragonflies. So that's an amazing feature to have out in the field with you. Um, and it's citizen science. Every time you send in a picture, it's letting the global community of Dragonfly scientists know which dragonflies are being found where at what time. Odonata Central in that dragonfly app is probably used by more dragonfly scientists than the other website in North America. So you're in good company. And lastly, I would just say as impressive as that app is, I'm kind of old school, but I would always bring at least one paper field guide with you. Um, there are times when those apps are the best thing, but there are other times when you really need to flip through an actual field guide. And if you've done a lot of identifying in the field, you know there's pros and cons of both. So bring your iPhone or your Android, but also have one of those field guides in your back pocket too. And you may have already listed this, but I got several questions before the event because the app has a different name on Android versus iPhone. Oh, I didn't um, didn't know that. So it's a little confusing. So the one on Android is just called Dragonfly ID. Um, but if you're on iPhone, you actually have to search for Dragonfly and Damselfly field guide and ID. Oh. Um, so it's a little, but it, it has the same logo. So you can tell because of the logo. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. Thank you. I didn't know that. Something else I wanted to mention, it has a little tutorial on it. So when you go to the app, click on settings, there's a little gear at the bottom of the screen that says settings, looks just like the settings icon on, on your laptops. Mm -hmm. Click on settings and then clip on tutorial and it'll walk you through the whole, the whole app and tell you exactly how to use it. That sounds great. This I think you've also addressed a little bit, but I think there's quite a bit more that can probably be said about this, this question, which is how can we enhance habitat? for dragonflies? Yeah, that's an important question. Maybe the most important, right? Because we want to be able to help these guys. Um, well, water quality is super important. There are some dragonflies that are really tough and I've seen them lay eggs in parking lot puddles, but that's the minority. Most dragonfly nymphs are sensitive to water quality. Um, easily more than half of them, probably 75% of dragonfly species, their nymphs are quite sensitive to water quality. So anything that would improve water quality for let's say trout or salmon is also going to improve it for dragonflies. So reduction of pesticides and fertilizer, um, increased width of riparian buffers because that creates more filtering 
to improve water quality. Um, anything that's going to help a stream or river system. So those things that I just mentioned. Um, also a basic thing that you see in developed areas is it's sort of human nature, unfortunately, to want to control the edges of our waterways. So people often mow or cut or clear down to the edge of their lake or down to the edge of their pond or the river or their stream because it looks neater. But what you're doing when you do that is you're removing the dragonfly habitat. You're creating a water habitat that's great for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes don't care if there's any vegetation on the edge, but the dragonflies need that. So encouraging people to keep vegetation on the sides of our waterways, I think is important. And this is actually the last question. I think uh, Margo has one more comment after this, but um, about the Dragonfly ID app, um, does it help you identify based on a photo you send it? Right, And yes. does the website do that as well? Right, and yeah, Carrie and I were talking about that, trying to figure that out. Um, I will have to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I've just started using it, but here's how I understand it. The key that the Dragonfly app has will help you identify your picture because it will tell you because of your zip code and the colors that you've told us and the size and habitat, we believe it has to be one of these two or three species. And then you can choose which one looks most like the one you're looking at. So it, it helps you do the identification. Also, once you send the picture in, there is a process of other members of the site and other scientists looking at it to verify the picture and I believe you can ask for help from members mm -hmm. on the ID, but I don't think it automatically identifies it. When you send it in a picture, there isn't like a computer algorithm that looks at it and instantly identifies it. I think you have to do mm -hmm. that. And then I, th I believe it's kind of peer reviewed and peer checked later. Mm -hmm. The last comment is, is, is a great one. It is just a comment, but it's sort of a wonderful one to wrap up with. This viewer said, I love the idea of starting a dragonfly habitat at my school. Thank you so very much for this very interesting class. So Kevin, we do thank you so much for all of your knowledge mm -hmm. and your willingness to share it with us and to do this second round for, <laughs> for people who are perhaps weren't at the event. And um, I want to thank, thank everybody that was there for coming and wanted to let any of you that are watching this afterwards know that we have many more programs coming up in the next couple of months. And there's some particularly interesting ones on identifying plants using Calflora as a citizen science approach. And also another one on personal action that people can take in climate control. Uh, climate change. In order to find out more about these, please go to our website, which is cei.sonoma.edu, and under the calendar section, you will find what the events are coming up, and we're continually adding new programs to it, so come back and visit us often and see what we're offering that fits into your interest scheme. So thank you again, Kevin, and thank you, Carrie, for your support on this, and we'll be Seeing you all hopefully very soon. Thank you. And actually, one more um, one more event that might be of particular interest. I hadn't thought of it until just now, but we have our citizen science event on aquatic invertebrates. Oh, so, wow. dragonfly nymphs could be included in that. I think they are actually. So that one is by Wendy St. John, who teaches with environmental science. Um, uh, it's now geography, environment, and planning, and also with biology at SSU. Um, and I think that one is May 15th. Um, it's a Friday, also at two. Exciting. That's wonderful. Great. That's great. Well, thank you all again, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. I had a great time. Mm -hmm.